Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We begin this briefing with a question by Steve Alquist of Uprise RI. He must be the fastest typer of all reporters because <laughs> he always <laughs> seems to get the first question. He asks, Governor, grocery store workers across the country are starting to test positive for and die of COVID-19. Do these workers and all low-wage essential workers deserve time and a half hazard pay and mandatory workplace safety by executive order if need be? Yeah, so thank you for the question. And I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the fact that while so many people are, are out of work and laid off and struggling, there are many thousands of Rhode Islanders who have to go to work every day, um, most especially healthcare workers, first responders, many people in state employment and cities and towns, and, and grocery store workers. And I, I want to thank you for doing your part in this crisis and for your bravery. Uh, it is the responsibility of every employer to do, whatever, to do everything they can in order to protect the health and safety of their employees. First and foremost, it means any employee who is sick, even a little bit, has to be sent home, cannot be forced to work, period, at all, under any condition. And I want to remind everyone that by federal law, you have 10 days, a minimum, of 10 days paid sick leave. So that's extremely important. Uh, we are certainly working hard on our end to procure more surgical masks and gloves that we're going to continue to push out to healthcare workers and PPE, uh, the, the uh, respiratory masks and, and gowns. We're pushing that out to, to folks in healthcare. And I would say the same for grocery stores. Do, uh, you need to do everything that you can, space out your employees far enough, give them uh, hand sanitizer, ample opportunity to wash their hands, nobody comes in when they're sick, and do everything that you can do to keep them safe. Next question is for Dr. Alexander Scott. This is from Matt Allen. Can you describe how someone is officially determined to have died from COVID-19? Is there an assumption that if they die while infected with the virus, that is the virus that killed them? If so, does that artificially inflate the fatality rate data? Thank you. We are specifically using the term COVID-19 associated fatality. We understand that if someone has COVID-19, it may or may not be the cause of their death, but it's important for us to be able to um, have the data that shows that COVID-19 was associated with that person's death. This is consistent with uh, the public health approach across the country on how we are assessing um, the fatalities associated with COVID-19. Our next question is from John DiPietro, and also a question for you. It was announced that when the state hits 80% capacity at hospitals, the makeshift ones would be utilized. What percentage are we at now, and when do you envision we hit the 80% mark? Uh, that's an important question. Um, we are using a variety of mechanisms to be able to see when we need to expand to the alternate care sites um, that are working um, very quickly to be set up in place. Um, so I don't have the numbers specifically of the percentage of where we are now. We can certainly get back to providing that. But we are working closely with the hospitals to be able to surge their capacity um, first within the hospital settings prior to expanding to an alternate care site. So working with them, we have a targeted approach in terms of when it is necessary to expand to those additional sites while the hospitals continue to do the work that they have to um, plan for increased capacity within their uh, localized facility. We have both mechanisms um, being advanced forward together simultaneously. This next question is actually for both of you and the governor from Tony Mendez of POTR 102. How do you disconnect from these difficult times we're living? What do you recommend Rhode Islanders do to find peace and remain sane in this new reality? That's an excellent question, uh, Tony. It, it is so important to be able to take a breath and to reflect uh, during these times. For me personally, it's looking at what um, things around me I have to be thankful for. You know, if, if we're not able to get together um, with uh, family, 
uh, the way we'd like to. I'm thankful that my family is safe and I can still communicate with them um, electronically and on video. Or if we're not able to, um, you know, be able to go to a, a social gathering that we'd like to go to, we're thankful to be able to um, come together and, and have a meal or um, what's needed to um, move forward. So those are ways for me to um, be able to take a breath and reflect on what things I'm thankful for in the midst of that and use that to stay motivated to keep going forward every day. Thank you. Governor? Thank you. Uh, I agree with everything Nicole said, as I always do. You know, from, I love to go outside. I do, I continue to say this, but I think even just a walk around the block and a chance to, uh, the, the flowers are starting to be in bloom. There's a lot of beauty. And so just getting outside, taking a walk, taking a minute to slow down. I think exercising every day is very important. And a phrase that General Callahan has taught me is a battle buddy. Try to get a battle buddy. So try to, try to find a person or persons, people in your life, who will check in on you and you check in on them. Uh, of course, you can't see them and that makes it difficult, but I said so many times, don't let yourself get isolated. You, even if you're alone physically, pick up the phone and call somebody, text somebody, FaceTime, just find a way to prevent yourself from being isolated and have human contact every single day. Every day, make sure you have some human contact and, it, and it'd be great if you could have human contact with the same people and you have an arrangement where you help each other out because so many people out there are saying, oh God, this is so hard, you know, how are you doing? I'm struggling like everybody else, ups and downs every single day. So know that you're not alone and find a way to keep yourself connected with some other people in your life. Steve Clampkin from WPRO asks, can you foresee any assistance for college students living on their own but who've lost their jobs and cannot pay for food or rent? Yes, so uh, excellent question, uh, and I'm going to continue to find specific answers. At the moment, unemployment insurance, chances are you're eligible for it. I want to remind everybody, uh, as of yesterday, there, the new unemployment insurance rules are in effect, so freelancers, gig economy, et cetera, workers, go to the DLT website, file for unemployment insurance, uh, all of the food delivery that we are mentioning, or the food bank, or 211, we are raising a lot of philanthropy to help folks get through with food, with essentials, with rent, and that's, that's for everybody, including college students. So I don't have an answer specifically for college students specifically, um, but we will continue to work on that, and I'm open to ideas, but remember that everything that's available for everyone should be taken advantage of by college students. Next question for the doctor from Tanya Signori of the RI Echo. For people who are former smokers that catch COVID-19, how does this impact their recovery? We are seeing that um, folks who are former smokers are oftentimes also associated with being people who may have some forms of underlying illness, oftentimes uh, associated with uh, being a former smoker and are having a little bit more of a challenging time uh, with COVID-19. It does tend to impact the lower respiratory system where our lungs are. And so it is uh, something that people can be aware of. It's helpful also for people who are currently smoking to know that there is benefit in quitting smoking and you can still go to 1-800-QUIT-NOW to receive the services uh, for doing that. And then it's also helpful to know for people who are smokers or otherwise, there are other vaccines that are out there that can also help minimize, like the flu vaccine, the pneumonia vaccine are also good to get to help build your reserve in being able to um, combat this and prevent against COVID-19. 
This next question from Alan Gaberti. It's broken down into a bunch of different questions, so I'll start with what criteria must be met to diagnose recovery, for example, two negative tests, and is someone who's recovered without testing able to carry and spread the virus? So there are two strategies to be able to clear someone um, of COVID-19 or say that they have fully recovered. There is a test-based strategy, which is two negative tests over more than a 24-hour period. We're usually reserving that approach for folks who may be hospitalized with COVID-19, and the hospital needs to know whether or not uh, personal protective equipment is still needed if a person has recovered from their symptoms um, but is still in the hospital. There are the second strategy is a non test based strategy. It's one that's just based on symptoms. This is what we are recommending for the majority of people who have COVID 19, hospitalized or otherwise. It means that you have to have at least seven days since the symptoms began. You have to have the last three days be one that you have no fever, and that's without taking any fever-reducing medication. And the last um, three days have to involve improvement of symptoms, and your symptoms need to have completely resolved. With all of those applied, that is when someone is considered recovered from COVID-19, and it's particularly important for people who need to return to work. He goes on to ask, how many in Rhode Island have recovered, and is that number reflected in daily updates? So the way we are able to determine that is knowing the number of new cases that we have, um, plus being able to see who is hospitalized and then who has unfortunately passed away. The remaining numbers between those two uh, groups of numbers are all people who have recovered. The next question, Governor, is from Michael Bilo of Motif Magazine. A hunger strike has been reported at the Wyatt Detention Center, and a drive-by in-car protest has been announced for Friday at 11 a.m. You've worked with the Rhode Island Department of Corrections at the ACI, but what authority and responsi responsibility do you have for Wyatt? What are your options? So I was not aware of that, and I don't have authority over Wyatt because it's a federal facility. Having said that, I do uh, care deeply about what's happening in my state, so I'll have to look into it more. Do you have anything to add? Next question is from Ryan Belmore of What's Up Newport. Wedding season has arrived in Rhode Island with hundreds of weddings scheduled across the state over the next three months. What advice or guidance do you have for those couples who are planning to host their big day? Yeah, so this is a tough one, and I've heard from a number of couples um, this is obviously very personal. We cannot relax the restrictions now, so if, in a, which is to say you cannot have a large gathering under any circumstances. So if you wanted to have a small, intimate wedding with five or fewer people, uh, go ahead and do that and get married, and then I would say push off the bigger celebration for later. But f at least for now, and I think it's safe to say in the months to come, it's going to be very difficult for us to allow large group gatherings. So for, for your own planning purposes, I'll leave it to you, but I, th I think if you want to go ahead and get married, keep it small now and plan for the party uh, much later in the year or next year. Next question from Bill Bartholomew. Bartholomew, are surgical masks being distributed for grocery store and pharmacy employees? Grocery store and pharmacy employees fall within the group that I've referred to previously as our critical infrastructure workers. These are workers that we strongly encourage wearing some form of face cloth mask, um, face cloth covering, so that they are able to minimize the amount of uh, infectious particles that are released into the air. Um, we have a team of people working um, night and day to get us the supply of surgical masks that we need in this state for the long term and for as many people as need be. 
when those are available, we will look towards being able to advance those to critical infrastructure um, workers who we think would uh, benefit. But it's important for everyone to know the ability to wear the face cloth coverings is an effective way to go forward as you are um, doing the critical infrastructure work that you're doing. Our last question for this Wednesday briefing is for the governor from Ted Nisi of WPRI. The British Prime Minister is in the ICU with coronavirus right now. Hopefully, you do not get sick, of course, but what is the contingency plan you have in place if you yourself fall ill? Well, of course, it would depend uh, how ill I were to become. If I'm able to work from home, then that's what I'll do. If I have to go to the hospital, we have a terrific team in place. And I think I'll leave it at that. I think we all know what happens with the chain of command if something more were to happen to me. But I want, I want people to know this. Although you see me every day, there's a thousand people behind me, more than a thousand people behind me, working seven days a week. We, I have uh, set up a series of work streams. I have a team on PPE. I have a team on thinking about how to get the economy reopened. I have nearly 1,000 National Guard men and women deployed all over the state, getting our surge plans in place. We're working well with the hospitals. So I don't plan on going anywhere, and I know how to work from home. But I want you to know we've got this. It isn't just me. It's, a, it's an army of people, and every day we get a little bit better at what we're doing. Thank you, Governor. Thanks.